Matthew chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are in- innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, Will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. I want to point your attention to something. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. Something to consider when you see, you know, some of the strategies of people in counterfeit Christianity, when you see them slamming their fist on a pulpit and screaming down at you, jumping around on stage and making a big to do about their sermon. It's really like, more of an entertainment thing is what they're doing. They're appealing to your flesh. They're not appealing to your heart. They're getting you puffed up in some sort of weird power, weird self-righteousness. Something to also consider when you see that there are ministries, like literally people have made a ministry of calling out and fighting with everybody else. It's one thing if God has put it on you for a specific purpose to call something out. But frankly, this is a waste of time to sit and just call out every false teacher. Why? How does that edify the body? Now, you have seen that there have been certain people who I have called out, but it's because I'm calling out the teachings, the false teachings that are readily acceptable, readily accepted and are confusing and deluding God's people. So when I'm talking about someone like David Jeremiah or Jimmy Evans who are preaching pre-tribulation rapture, That is infecting the church. It is keeping people from being in the right standing because they think that they've already been saved and they think they're going to be picked up before they have to do any of the things that Jesus Christ himself said we must do and we must do until the end, that we must endure till the end. And let me tell you when the end is. The end will not come until the abomination of desolation has been set up. So these are specific destructive heresies that the church needs to understand are heresies. They're in direct conflict with the word of God. These are the people who are preaching them who have major platforms and they are absolutely false. I want you to distinguish between that and a person who is making a ministry of just calling everybody out. That, frankly, is not... There's no biblical precedent for that. There is biblical precedent for what I'm doing. Paul did it all the time. He would tell you, this is a cult who has bewitched you. He would clarify the doctrine. He would um, clarify why that doctrine could not possibly be true. Nevertheless, Paul, Jesus, the rest of the apostles and servants of God were not 
chasing around every false teacher on the planet and causing you to do likewise because what happens when you're doing that is your focus is on the devil and what the devil is doing. You need to be focused on what God is doing and what he's doing in you. It's incredibly important that we understand that because people who criticize people are a dime a dozen. That's not the pattern of God's ministry, period. It's not. So those people are not from him. They are not enacting a ministry that is from him. So again, look at the difference. Look at what Jesus did. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. He didn't start then going after the Pharisees and saying, and then they said this, and then they said that, and then they said, he said, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Enough said. They're evil. What they're doing is wrong. He also said, listen to what they're teaching you regarding the law. That is true. But don't follow their examples. So he was giving discernment, but he wasn't chasing them down. He didn't have, he wasn't wasting his time in a ministry where he called out every false prophet, every false teacher. He taught the overarching concepts so that we would understand if you know what the truth is and then you hear the lie, you're going to know. You're going to know that it's a lie because you're going to, you know the truth. My advice to you is place your focus on the truth. My suggestion is also this. If the way in which a person is preaching, the message that they're preaching, the manner in which they're preaching is in conflict with the word, they are not from God. No one should be screaming at you because Jesus himself did not quarrel or cry out. No one heard his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he did not break. A smoldering wick he did not snuff out. People either heard his message or they didn't, and those who could not hear their message, he identified as children of the devil. He did not identify them as your brothers and sisters. He identified them as children of the devil whose desire was to do their father's desires. So don't go wasting your time. If people cannot hear the message of God, you dust your feet in protest. It will be worse for them on the day of judgment than for Sodom, Tyre, and Sidon. God is the one who decides who are his. We don't. So screaming it into someone or hanging out until they get it, those are not things that are taught in the word of God. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? I mean, that's a big deal for someone to not be able to talk or see and to be fully restored. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges." But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. All right, so Jesus is actually acknowledging that their people were driving out spirits and that they were driving them out by Satan. A lot of times this scripture is miscited or misrepresented, but Satan's kingdom is not going to stand, you guys. Satan has no loyalty. He goes after his own people to steal, kill, and destroy. He will not have a kingdom that stands. Here's the thing you need to understand, that when you are going to those who practice what is of Satan, because I've spoken with many people who've done this, gone to energy healers and, uh, you know, psychics and the occult, essentially, and they did get better. They did get better in some ways, but then they continued to remain in bondage. It ends up being relentless. There's no end to the supposed healing that they need. I shared with you that when I was uh, when I was working with that woman who claimed to be some sort of energy healer, spiritual medicine, vibrational homeopathy practitioner, there were things that she had me do, and I actually did feel relief. I did feel better, but it was never ending. Then the next thing came up. Then the next thing came up. And she would tell me things like, well, you're healing in layers. And it's in order to hook you and keep you there so that you continue to think that, oh, I'm healing. This is just another layer. 
Now, this is different from what God is doing in you, because when God is doing this, you are going to resolve and he's going to testify to the work that he's doing. But that's not what was happening with this woman. So you have to understand that Satan is perfectly capable of manipulating things and giving you a different issue by whatever spirit is tormenting you in order to deceive you and make you think that you're healing. That is exactly what happens when you're going to medicine. You start out with one cancer, now you got another one. But you think that the first one was healed. It ends up being relentless. You are never fully restored. And there's never any purpose to what's going on because Satan doesn't have a purpose but to destroy you. As long as you need to understand that what I'm about to say, as long as Satan has you in bondage, as long as you keep deferring to him and his, the idols that he hides behind, you're in bondage and he can continue to attack you and continue to break down your body, especially if you've given him full access to your body. So Jesus is not saying that Satan is not able to drive out or manipulate. Listen to what he's saying. Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Is Satan's kingdom going to be ruined? Yeah. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Is Satan's city and household going to be an enduring city and household? The city of Edom or of Babylon? No, they're going to be destroyed. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. Just so happens, Satan is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? Well, it won't. And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? Do you hear what he's saying? Who are their people? The sorcerers, the magicians, the diviners, same people who are doing it today. But you have to understand the difference. When God drives that spirit out, when he casts a spirit out, it is because you learned the lesson and his will was fulfilled and he will heal you and seal you and that will not be able to come back when satan drives it out it is for the purpose of keeping you in bondage and manipulating you and deceiving you into thinking that you've been healed when really what you've done is you've just continued to remain in bondage to him he has free reign over you because you've given it to him but if it is by the spirit of god that i drive out demons then the kingdom of god has come upon you so essentially, you discern for yourself, is what I'm doing from God or is what I'm doing from Satan? Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. So is that something that he's doing? Because he's referring to these people whom he is casting out demons as a house. So he's tying up the strong man and carrying off his possessions and plundering his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. You understand what that means? Either you're with him or you're not. You have to gather with him or you'll be scattered. If you're not with him, you're against him. It's not even that you're like alongside him or parallel or anything else. If you're not with him, you're against him. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Do you understand what that is? Blasphemy against the spirit. It means that you are speaking evil against the spirit. You are speaking falsehood against the spirit of God. There's blasphemy and then there's blasphemy against the spirit of God. If you are speaking blasphemy against the Spirit of God, you will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Now, let's, te let's test that with, what, with the context with which we're reading this, because we need to be clear about what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. What they are doing is they are speaking against the Spirit by which Jesus was driving out spirits. They were saying that the spirit by which Jesus drives out spirit, which is the spirit, the Holy Spirit, that that was Beelzebul. That was an example of blasphemy against the spirit of God. That is the one sin that will not be forgiven. Okay, so that interpretation is interpreted by the word in the very context that we're reading. 
make a tree good and its fruit will be good or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad for a tree is recognized by its fruit. Where's the tree? Is the tree just your body? No, he's talking about rebirth. He's talking about what happens during the process of rebirth. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27 tells us exactly what happens. Our heart of stone is removed. A new heart is placed in us, a softened heart. God places his spirit inside of our heart and he begins to move us to follow his laws and keep his decrees. He makes us a new tree. And if he makes us a new tree, then the fruit that comes out of us has to be good fruit. It has to be true fruit. He has to be moving us. And if that's not happened, we're not his. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. So he's telling them, you're speaking empty words and you're speaking evil. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. So yesterday I uploaded a video talking about why etiology is important. Why does it matter that we know that we have a firm grasp on what are the causes of our afflictions? Who sends them? Why does he send them? What are we handed over to when we continue to spurn him and sin? What needs to happen in order for them to come out? If you don't know what the causes are, you can't possibly know what the solutions are. And that's the problem in medicine. That's the problem in mental health. That's the problem in science is that they deny the creator. And so they have no truth because everything that God has established, the devil attempted to erase by men who were wise in their own eyes, philosophers. Doctors, magicians, sorcerers, science, rewriting everything that got established to the point that now I talk with, you know, self-proclaimed Christians and they think, they say things like, well, I think God can use science. Yeah, God can use whatever he wants, but will he use a field that has rewritten his truth? Will he use a field that denies that there's a creator and claims that we evolved from nothing? That we're here to compete against each other rather than to treat each other with decency and to take care of the poor among us? Everything in opposition to him. God can do anything, but will he? God does not need science, nor is he tempted to use it. What's the etio etiology? What did Jesus teach us is the etiology of our afflictions and our illnesses and our diseases. He said, I am the Lord who heals you. If you obey me, I will not put any of the diseases that I put on the wicked Egyptians. Return to me and I will heal you. And here he drives out spirits and tells us exactly what's going to happen with this generation. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and doesn't find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied. Why is it unoccupied? Because when that spirit was cast out, that person did not return to God. And therefore, they are not occupied by his spirit. So it's this spirit, this spirit that was cast out comes back, finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. And then it goes and takes with it 
seven other spirits. So the freak, the uh, quantity goes up more wicked than itself. The intensity and severity and evil goes up and they go and live in there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. Could he have been any more clear? What more could he have done to teach us the nature of illness and disease and what we need to do? If it wasn't enough for him to tell us for thousands of years, return to me and I will heal you, then to demonstrate it when people went into captivity and then returned to him and they were restored. And then they disobeyed again and they went back into captivity. And then they returned to him and he restored them. If it wasn't enough for him to establish that you must go into isolation for seven days and it, then if you start getting better, you are demonstrating the fruit of repentance and return and you go back into isolation to finish what he has started. But if you do not, you are cast outside of the camp. Was it not enough that he then sent his son to demonstrate through the casting out of spirits what was causing these things, to say to them and to teach them about repentance, to teach them to bear fruit that is in keeping with repentance, to teach them the fulfillment of the things that God had established, that yes, these are the things that are written in the law regarding clean food and unclean food, but I tell you, these things that you are putting in your mouth are not the things that defile you. It is what is coming out of your mouth because it's coming from your heart That's where you're defiled. That's where you need to be cleansed. Is it not enough that he gave us his Holy Spirit to minister to us? That we then reject the ministry of his Holy Spirit and we pray for him to anoint the hands of pagans who teach things that are in opposition to him, who try to make his people forget his name and remember theirs as heroes and experts, who again teach in opposition to what he has established and who he is. And we reject and spurn the Holy Spirit And we pursue idols and heroes before our God, before the ministry that we're supposed to be receiving from his spirit, the healer, the counselor, the only physician we could ever need. This is why the final condition of people today is worse than it was at first. This is why our children are suffering. This is why they're confused. They think they have depression. They're suicidal. They think that they were born in the wrong body. That is what we are dealing with right now. This is spirit occupation. These are spirits that are possessing our most precious blessing because we have no understanding, because we have no knowledge, because we have not loved truth. What more could he have done? What more could he have done to teach us? While Jesus was talking to the crowd, his mothers and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who's my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. I mean, what more could you need in your entire existence than to belong to Jesus' family? You realize how ridiculous it is that we would go and pursue man, man's expertise, man's powers, which they don't have any power rather than wanting to be his mother, brother, or sister. If we do, if we will just do the will of his Father in heaven, there's nothing else that can come against us. We're in that protection. And yes, in this life, that means persecution, and it means death, and it means a lot of things that are not pleasant. But he doesn't leave us without understanding or strengthening or wisdom. We make these decisions because of the joy that's set before us, and he gives us a glimpse of that joy. He doesn't just leave us to wonder if we're fighting this fight in vain, running this race in vain. So what's the heart of God in this chapter? We started the chapter with an understanding of basically self-righteous Pharisees who didn't want to accept the Messiah, and so they're constantly looking for a way to trap him and to accuse him. Same, same thing that they did with God's servants, right? Jeremiah You hear Jeremiah's lament constantly about that. They're setting a trap for me. They're whispering. So they're constantly trying to set a trap for Jesus, even with the law that God established. I mean, that's pretty evil, right? To use what God established to try to trap his son. 
So they're trying to trick him into saying something that's going to be against the law. But see, Jesus has more understanding than they do. He has more wisdom than they do. And he's constantly talking about the fulfillment of the law. He's constantly able to take all of it into context. Yes, the law says this, and it's good to do good on the Sabbath. There's no but there. You have to understand that. The, the, yes, the law says this, but no. No but. Yes, the law says this, and this is also true. And that's the same way that we need to be looking at the word of God. Yes, the word says you are saved if. And the word also says you are working out your salvation and that you must endure, endure until the end. So when the word says you are saved if, it is saying, if you are bearing this fruit, you're one of the ones. If you're not, you believed in vain, false alarm. Well, how could you have a false alarm if it's already a sure thing? If you continue to bear that fruit, if you continue to believe in the gospel that has been preached to you, you don't have your guarantee yet. What is the heart of God there? Know the law. Believe in what he has established care about his heart in what he established and seek to understand the fulfillment of it. Do not abolish it. Do not claim that the things that are written in the law don't apply to you today. They very much apply to you from the perspective of understanding God's heart and why it is that you have fulfillment today through Jesus Christ. It is good to do good on the Sabbath. Do not get tripped up in rigid adherence at the expense of understanding. You can't possibly please, we can't please God if we have no understanding of his heart and we're just obeying a rule for this and a rule for that. He rebukes that. Those are the hearts that are hardened. These are those who are going to be entrapped, ensnared, and fall backward. Now there's, in verse 16, it says he warned them not to tell others about him. So he's healing, but he's telling people, don't tell others about me. And you might wonder, why doesn't he want anyone to tell others about him? But remember that he wants those who actually believe. He wants to be able to also discern who are his and who are not. And how does the word tell us that he discerns? He discerns by seeing who's accepting his message, who's capable of hearing his message, who is obeying, who's pursuing the message, who's following him for the teaching. He's wanting them to come to understanding. And if you have any question about that, skip forward a few verses to verse 38, when the Pharisees and teachers of the law are asking for a sign. And he says, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. None will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. He doesn't want people to come to him just because he's performing signs and wonders. He wants what's in people's heart. He's not interested in in masses swarming him in order to see a sign. So now let's see the servant that God chooses, because again, we're reading the Gospels right now because we're wanting to understand the heart of God. So large crowds are following him. He's healing all who are ill. He's warning them, don't tell others about me. And then the prophet Isaiah is quoted as saying, here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. So listen to the heart. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. What does this Savior feel like to you? Because as I read that, he feels tender, he feels pure. The Father is delighting in him. Who does the Father delight in? Does he delight in us? No, he delights in his Son, who is pure, who is devoted, who's single-minded. He's not arguing, he's not quarreling or crying out. He is there to teach a message, and, and he moves from location to location just being about the father's business. People don't listen to what he says. He moves on again. He's not freaked out by it because he also knows that he came here to teach the world that its ways are wrong. He knows they're not going to like what he has to say. You know who else is supposed to know that? Us. We've already been told that the world is not going to like what we have to say. 
and yet we shrink from it all the time. Either counterfeit Christianity is timid and afraid, or they're getting puffed up on some power that they don't even have that is actually satanic. This whole movement of Christian nationalism, there is nothing about it that is biblical. Well, at least not biblical in the sense that it's something that God wants us to campaign for. Definitely biblically prophesied that there will be a combination of church and state and that it's going to be revealed in the Antichrist. That's what they're setting up right now. In the name of Christianity, really? That's just so scary that this is where we are. Um, I Never in a million years would I have thought that this would be something that Christianity was campaigning for. And the funny thing is, uh, not funny, actually. The ironic thing is, is that they think that the left is somehow setting up the Antichrist. No, they are setting up the Antichrist. They think that it's the world that's doing it. And it's actually the world in counterfeit Christianity. All right. What else are we seeing about the heart of God? Well, we see that there's only one sin that's not going to be forgiven, and that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is truly cherished by God. Not that the Son isn't, not that the Father isn't, right? But the Holy Spirit is truly cherished in this particular way that if anyone is speaking against what the Holy Spirit is doing, they're speaking evil against what the Holy Spirit is doing, they won't be forgiven. And I have a feeling that this is really going to become well understood in these last days as the servants and messengers and witnesses of God are speaking his message and are being accused of being demon possessed or, you know, these very things that Jesus was being accused of. And if you think about that for a minute, if you think about what's written in Revelation regarding the witnesses and those who speak against God's anointed. Now think about what they're doing. If they're speaking against God's anointed and they're speaking against that message that's coming, hello, from the Holy Spirit, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about asking questions. I'm talking about speaking against what the Holy Spirit is doing through his servants. They are going to die by the fire that comes out of their mouth. Now, I don't know that that happens now. It, there's no... It doesn't necessarily indicate that that's going to happen in the moment, but you have to understand that on the day of judgment, that God's people are sitting in those seats as judges for the wicked. And if there are people who have spoken against his anointed, who have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, who have said that this message is coming from demons, well, they will be consumed by the fire that comes out of their mouths. So I believe that that is a message regarding the judgment. And again, that is how they will die. We're not talking about physical death. We're talking about eternal death. So he already warned. He already warned about this. Say whatever you want about me, but you start talking about the Holy Spirit. That's a game changer. That will not be forgiven. And then again, you see here that those who are asking for a sign, what is God's heart? feel about this. A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. None will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. You have been given signs. You have seen. And you know, let me tell you something. If you are living truly in him, he's going to reveal himself. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all of your needs are going to be added to you, and he is going to reveal himself. He is going to prove himself to you. But it should not be that you're running because someone got healed, so now you're running to go see what he's doing. He does, that's not the heart of God. He doesn't like that. He wants you to pursue and seek righteousness and the kingdom of heaven, not the signs. And lastly, in this chapter, we see that He's not necessarily concerned about the family that you were born into as being your family. In fact, families are going to be divided. Households will be divided, right? But those who do the will of his father in heaven, those are who he considers to be his family. I hope this study of Matthew 12 has been helpful and given you some things to think about and also to orient your heart towards his heart. That's the most important thing we're doing in scripture. So I hope that that has been a lesson to you or, or something that you're adapting into your repertoire because it really is a game changer when you start reading the word with his desires and his heart as the truth that you're pursuing and what you're conforming your heart to. You, if you can do it that way, if you can study scripture from that perspective, 
you are going to understand things in a way that you never thought that you would understand them before. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.